in today's video, we're going to be creating this super cool effect that you can do with any image of your choice. We're going to deal with all of the different caveats you might face so that you can do this in EV, in cycles, and also with different aspect ratio images as well. It can be black and white or colored, and you're going to get super cool results. So without any further ado, step by step, let's get into it. In our default scene, we're not going to delete the default cube. Instead, we're going to go to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to open a new window, and we're going to change this to the geometry node editor. Now we're going to press new to add in a new geometry node tree and then we're going to delete the default cube by deleting the group input. Then we're going to search for a grid node and we're just going to plug the mesh into the geometry for the group output. We're also going to change the vertices down to two so that we can do math much easier later on. Let's search for a subdivide mesh node and plug that in right here. And we're going to change the level to whatever we want. The higher the number, the greater the resolution will be. So we'll keep it at something like eight. Now, if you press seven on your numpad to go to the top view, you can go to the wireframe view by clicking this button in the top right corner and you can see how fine the mesh is. The next thing is that we don't actually require this to be a single connected mesh. So we're gonna have to separate it. So let's search for a separate geometry node and plug that in right over here. Now that each of it has been separated, we can go ahead and just instance something onto each of the points. And before instancing, we can go back to our viewport shading of solid and let's search for an instance on points node and plug that in right over here. So we obviously need some instance to be instanced onto it. So let's search for a mesh circle and then we can change the fill type from none to n gone and reduce the radius to something really small. So let's start with 0.001 and plug that into our instance on points node. So that's the grid that we have. If you actually zoom in, you can see that we have each of the circles being placed within the grid. If you're using cycles, you can change this, but we'll do that later on in the video. But right now, I think that the circles are a little too small. So I'm going to increase the size to something like 0.19. And that seems to be large enough for what I require. So now we have a grid of points. We now have to get these points to actually move on the z-axis randomly. So to move anything in geometry nodes, we have to search for a set position node and we can just plug that in after the instance on points. Now the offset value has to be controlled by a random number. So let's search for a random value node. But the problem with a random value node is that it's going to give you a value that'll change the x, y, and z. We don't want it to change all of them. We want it to change only the z. So we're going to search for a combined x, y, z node and we're just going to plug that in over here. And we're going to take the value from the random value and plug it into the z value of the combine XYZ and then plug this into the offset of the set position. So now immediately we get all of the points randomly moved up and down on the Z axis. If we change the max value down to zero, it's going to go back to being the grid that we initially had. And this value is what we're going to use to animate our main effect. The next thing is to get the textures to actually align correctly to each of these. We actually have to realize the instances. So we're going to go ahead and search for a realize instance node and plug that in right over here. And finally, to actually give it its material, we're going to have to search for a set material node and plug that in just before the group output. For the material, there's already a default material, so we can just use that because we're not using that for anything else. And with that, your geometry node section is mostly done. The next thing that we have to do is the texturing. So we're going to change the geometry node editor from geometry node to the shader editor, and we're going to change our viewport shading to render. Similarly, we're just going to press seven on our numpad to go to the top view and press control alt zero to lock our camera to view. After that, we can just play around with the Z position of the camera just to make everything fit in perfectly. So I think something like that is fine. Then I'm going to go to the camera properties, change viewport display passport out all the way to one so that we don't see anything outside the camera. And I'm going to go to the world properties and change the color of the world all the way to white. With that done, I'm going to select our main object and give it its material. So the first thing that we need is an actual image. So let's search for an image texture node and plug that right in here. Now we have to open whatever image you want. I'm gonna use a one is to one aspect ratio image first and I'll show you how to change everything up for different aspect ratios later on. So once you have that, you can plug the color into the base color and you can just switch off overlays to see what you have. Along with that, we're gonna have to press control T with the node that I'm switched on to get the texture coordinate and mapping nodes. And we're gonna change the texture coordinates from UV to object. So once you do that, you'll actually see where your texture coordinates lie. And this is the image that we have. Now, clearly it's not positioned properly. So we're going to have to change the location from zero to something like 0 0.5 on the X and the Y. And that way it'll get perfectly fit in. Now, the next thing is if you actually zoom in, each circle has like a number of colors and it's not perfect that each circle is a single color. So we have to fix that. And we've actually used a very similar technique in this video that you can check in the top right corner right now. However, we'll do it again really simply. So I'm just going to search for a Voronoi texture 
and I'm going to press Ctrl T on the Voronoi texture as well and switch it from generated to object. And then I'm going to press Ctrl Shift click with the Node Wrangler switched on to see what we have. And this is what our Voronoi texture currently looks like. So we're going to have to change the randomness all the way to zero. And after that, remember the subdivision level that we added in in our geometry node editor. So we added in a subdivision surface or subdivide mesh of level eight. So we're going to have to go to our shader editor and for the actual scale of our Voronoi texture, we're going to have to do two to the power whatever level we had. So in this case, two to the power eight, which is 256. So if we do that, each circle is going to get exactly one dot, which is exactly what we want. Similarly, we don't want it to actually be the distance, but we want it to be the position. And that way, each dot is going to be a single color. And we're going to be using that to drive the value of our image texture. So we're going to take this position, plug that into the vector of the image, and then control shift click our principal BSDF to see what we have. Now that again resets the position of our image because we're now using the mapping from the Voronoi texture. So to change that, all we have to do is change the location over here to 0.5. So the X and Y is going to be changed to 0.5. And then we can get rid of the texture coordinate and mapping nodes over here. Remember, if you want to change both of these together, you can just shift, click and drag to highlight both of them. And then you can add in whatever number you want and it'll change it for, for both of them together. So now if you actually look at it, each circle is going to be a single color and together they're going to form the image that you have. The next thing is we don't want this to be faded off. It seems slightly washed away. And that's because our viewport or color management is set to filmic. So to change that, we're going to go to our render properties, go all the way down to color management and change it from filmic to standard. And that way, whites actually remain white and our colors remain our actual colors. With that, we can go ahead and work with all of the caveats, if at all it is not square or if you're using cycles and things like that. So in case it's not a square image, let's just take a look at what we do. Over here, after the Voronoi texture, we're going to search for another mapping node and just that. So we can press Shift D and plug that into the Voronoi texture right here. But we're going to have to change this location from 0.5 to 0. And now let's open up a non square image. So right now I've added in my non square image and you can see that it looks fine, but it's actually stretched out on the Y axis. I think you'd be able to tell better with this image, which is a black hole. And you can clearly tell that it's stretched out on the Y. All you have to do is change the scale on the new duplicated mapping node that you've added in over here on the Y to match up the original aspect ratio. To find out exactly how much that should be, find out the size of the original image. So in my case, you can see the image that I'm currently using has dimensions of 3000 pixels by 1500 pixels. So ideally, I already know that that's two, but for any other number, you'd actually type that in down here, 3000 divided by 1500, which is basically X divided by Y, and you press equal to, and you get a value. So whatever value you get in a calculator, you can go ahead and plug that down over here. So in this case, I'm going to plug two. And now you see it's going to be perfectly how it's supposed to be. However, you get a duplicated copy on top. So to change that, you're going to have to change it from repeat to clip. And that way you get only one image and the rest of it becomes just black. And then you can go ahead and just change the location of your Y till you get it centralized to whatever amount that you like. So in this case, minus 0.5 will make it perfectly centralized. So that's how you do it for something that's not a perfect square. Everything else remains the exact same. Similarly, if you're using cycles, we'll deal with that as well right now. In your geometry node editor, instead of instancing on points, all you can do is search for a mesh to points node and then take the selection from your separate geometry node into the mesh to points and then plug the output from that into the set position node. If you're in Eevee, you won't see anything happening. So you're gonna have to change the render engine from Eevee to cycles. And along with that, you're gonna have to change the radius down to the same radius that you had over here. So in my case, I'm just gonna take this control C and then plug that in over here, control V, enter. And and you're going to get circles with infinite resolution. So that's one method you can go about in case you're doing cycles. However, my laptop will not be able to handle this in cycles. And I feel like it's just too noisy for my liking. But the cool thing is that you get spheres of infinite radius, which is amazing. And I really wish Eevee could do that as well. In case these aren't matching up, like in my case, it is matching up. But in case it isn't for you, you can go ahead and change this from vertices to corners and things like that till you get it to actually match up. In certain areas, it might. In certain areas, it might not. So just play around with that in case you face that issue as well. Now I'm going to go back to Eevee and I'm going to use my instances on points and I have my image. With that, the last thing to do is the animation. I'm also going to switch back 
to my original image. So let's just choose the right image and again, fix the aspect ratio. So in, in case you want to make this versatile, you can keep this mapping node and just keep the location at zero and the scales at one and it'll be perfectly all right. Also, I don't want this black border. That'll happen only if it's on clip. So if I change it to extend or repeat, it's just going to become white and disappear. So that's perfectly all right. Similarly, you don't actually require an entire principal BSDF node. You can just search for a diffuse BSDF and plug the color in to that because that's just a little bit easier for your computer to handle. I'm going to increase the roughness all the way to one and delete my principal BSDF. With that, to animate, I'm going to go back to the geometry node editor and set all of my animation defaults. So I'm going to go ahead and change the frame rate to 30 frames per second, change the end frame to 300 so that it's a 10 second long animation, change the output to whatever folder you want it to be. File format is going to be FFmpeg video with an encoding container set to MPEG4 and output quality per substitute lossless. After that, in your geometry node, on frame number one, you can go ahead and just increase the max value to something like 10 and then press I and then go to a few seconds before your final value. So I'll go to frame 240. That's two seconds before my end. I'm just going to change this down to one or zero and then press I. And then I'm just going to select the node so that I can see the keyframes over here. Press T and change it to linear. And that way, when I actually play the animation, it all comes in like this. We're also going to have to change the playback from play every frame to frame dropping just so that we see the actual speed at which everything comes in. And I think this is all right. Apart from this, you can also switch on motion blur in case you want that. So to do that, you're going to have to go to your render properties and just switch on motion blur over here. Of course, I'm going to reduce the shutter to something like 0 0.2 that it's much lower and then just render out a single frame and you can see how the motion blur is there a bit here and there and I think this is perfectly all right. So after that we can keep it for one second so maybe till frame 270 we'll keep it. So press I and then by frame 300 we can go ahead and take our initial keyframe shift D and just place that there so that it all comes back out and that way it actually becomes a looping animation as well. There's a lot more that you can do such as instead of actually stopping it at one you can actually reduce it to below one as well and that gives you a different effect as well. Similarly you can start from something below one and then bring them all back into your actual frame and essentially all of those just give different effects. You also don't have to keep it absolutely perfectly at zero if you have an image that's not something like a painting, suppose you have a realistic image, you can actually keep this value at something really low and actually look a lot like a painting, which is an effect by itself. So there are a lot of different variations of this that you can actually make. And I hope you explore and have fun with this and create something amazing. Till then, don't forget to check out all of my other videos and comment all of your questions down below and I'll answer to all of them. Until the next video comes out, which is definitely going to be tomorrow, don't forget to stay creative.